Welcome to Pick Up and Deliver, the podcast where I pick up my audio recorder when I head out for a walk and deliver an episode to you while I stroll around. I'm Brendan Riley. Well, good morning, listeners. It is a lovely late September morning here in suburban Chicago. The sun is shining. The construction workers are using some sort of machine that reminds me of a ground digging machine from Beetlejuice. If you saw that that uh, movie, there's a scene where they have hired someone to till the ground outside of the house, and it's got these weird claw fingers. This is machine has a little scoop instead of claw fingers, but it still reminds me of it. Creepy. That's the machine that you can hear probably too loud on the microphone this morning. Hopefully it's not so loud that you can't hear me. All right, well, I'd like to give a shout out to reader Lance Coffee. Hey, Lance. Uh, wrote in with a few questions and some ideas for episodes. I will be send, I will be following some of those suggestions soon. Not today, because I had something else to talk about, but soon. I'm really enjoying myself lately because I realized, eh, about a month ago now, I guess, I realized that I was really feeling disconnected from my heavy gaming that I enjoy because my game group doesn't meet. And I had been in a habit of arranging so for a sort of bigger game every couple weeks when I would go to my regular game group on Tuesday nights. So I, uh, I decided I would start trying to do semi-regular, every other week, big games on Tabletop Simulator. Now, Tabletop Simulator is not my 100% favorite way to play a big game, but it's pretty good. I mean, if you turn on some voice chat and video chat, you get to play with your friends, and a lot of the mods on Tabletop Simulator are so close to the, the normal games that it's um, well, worth, well worth playing. And I only download mods for games that I own. I've talked about where I draw the ethical line regarding that space, and that's where it is for me. So I see that as, as uh, content shifting. Um, so anyway, I played Tricarion last night. Oh boy, that's a good game. <laughs> there's this one part where well, we decided there's a couple sub um, subtitles that Tricarion could have. Tricarion. Hold on, guys, I gotta think for a second. Okay. Uh, Tricarion. Shit, I forgot about that bonus. Uh, those are two of my favorites. Uh, and there's one point where I go, oh man, I love this game. <laughs> my friend Jason goes, tough decisions, huh? And it reminded me of, you know, one of my very first episodes, if you forget about this, is maybe episode two or three. I did an episode called Not Quite Enough, which was about my favorite feeling in, especially when you're playing a complicated game, when you just don't quite have enough to make everything happen. And Tricarion is a game of that. Everything you're doing, you're getting just enough to pay your workers and just enough to get the new trick and oh it's great really enjoyed my play i got 107 points which is four points below my best score ever not bad especially given that we weren't using the school uh so we weren't using the thing that gives you the extra bonuses but a good time good time but it did get me to thinking a little bit about um one choice that i made there was one point where so uh where i was hiring an assistant and the uh, or I was getting a trick and the tricks that were available there are two the way trick carry on works if you want to get a new trick you can always use one of the available trick slots to buy a trick for yourself from your preferred profession so I was playing the great optico so the eyeball tricks the optical illusion tricks are the ones that I could get all the time but I needed a, a chain an escape trick but those were not available what I had, there are two slots available. One of them had an X, meaning you can't get anything from that spot. And one of them had a gear, which means you could get a mechanical trick. Or like I said, I could always use that gear to get an optical trick because that's my preferred uh, strategy. So here's, the, inter- uh, the, here's the, the part that made me think of this topic. Because I, needed, uh, I wanted a link trick, an escape trick, I needed to use the action that allows you to reset one of the dice. So I could... And I knew as soon as I reset the dice, then I'm going to use that die, and it ends up, after you use a die, it ends up with the X, meaning someone else can't use it without resetting it. So then I had a choice. I could either use the die with the X, or use the die with the gear. I could reset either of them to be the, the chain, and then 
use that chain and make it into an X again. So I chose to reset the gear with the X or the die with the X into the chain, which I then turned back into an X. Now, tactically, that's probably the wrong move. The whole point in Tricarion is that you are competing with the other players and it's all about efficiency of action and edging, getting a little bit more uh, efficiency or value out of your actions than they get out of theirs. So when I go to choose the spell and I choose to reset the spell slot that's already taken, I'm in fact leaving that other spot open for somebody. Probably, in fact, I don't even say probably, I know for a fact the tactically stronger position would have been to use the spell slot that was available. I mean, I still had to reset it, so I'm paying the same price either way, but doing that limits my opponent's choices a bit more. So your first discussion question of the day, which would you do? Would you intentionally take the action that limits your opponent's choices more, even though it costs you the same? Or would you take the action that uh, does not affect your opponents, even though it costs you the same? I thought about it. I actually thought about it for a little while. And here's my thinking. There's two, so there's two parts. One, my general Care Bear philosophy says that I should not, that I generally am not going to do something to get in somebody else's way for no reason except winning. But the thing is, the goal of the game is winning. Like, this is a cutthroat game. You are constantly making decisions that get in other people's way. In fact, that is the primary way you compete in this game. It is, it's got a lot more take that than I usually enjoy in a game. But that's the nature of the game. So from the, everything about the game says I should have used that first uh, spell slot that was available. In fact, I'm kind of, <laughs> kind of talking myself out of the choice I made. I actually didn't use it. I used the X. And there's, there's two reasons for that. One, generally, if my choice is kick over somebody's sandcastle or don't, I choose don't, even if ultimately means I'm less likely to win. Uh, second, there is some argument for leaving it. Namely, if I have an opponent who's also going to that location and trying to figure out what they're doing, or say two opponents, and one of them wanted a spell but doesn't have enough money to reset the die again, by leaving that spell available, I then leave that choice available to them, which makes them more likely to use their action going there than to use it competing with me somewhere else again. That is a, that is a pale reason to choose that action. But uh, that is why I did it. That is, that is one, I think, tactical argument for leaving it open, is that it leaves the decision space open in a way that might draw them away from the thing I need next round. Anyway, I wasn't really planning on spending half of my walk or close to half my walk, talking about this choice. Uh, I think I'm going to have to walk an extra couple blocks just to have time to talk about things today. But I was thinking about, say you have a game and you want to encourage players to take the less competitive choice. Uh, the, you know, there's two... So I was thinking about what kinds of things are in games that, com that encourage more collaborative play mechanically while still feeling robust. Like, for instance... One thing you could do, so remember I said it costs two energy to reset a die. So if there's a die there, you can re-roll a die for one energy, or you can reset the die for two. If you reset it, you pick which side it's going, which face it's going to be on. Uh, perhaps there could be a thing where you get some better pay rate, some better rate of exchange if you reset a die that's been used as opposed to resetting a die that hasn't been used. Like one, mechanically, if you wanted to encourage people to leave the die available, you could say, if there are any dice available and you reset them instead of resetting a die that's not available, it costs an extra one. That would be a way to discourage that hyper-competitive behavior. Now I think in Tricarion, they want you to be hyper-competitive, so they aren't gonna do that. But I was thinking about that. And so that's my subject for today. What are some mechanisms that encourage or create gentler play in competitive games because a competitive game you still want to compete to win but there are different varieties of competing to win and i'm really interested in the way that some games encourage that competition while entirely allowing people to pursue their own uh, experience uh you know the the so i have a couple examples of games that have mechanisms that i think encourage gentler play or require it and then I think I have a couple examples that actually don't, are counterproductive. They seem like that's what they're there for, but they don't work. And then I wanted to talk a, a little bit more about that. Um, so Elizabeth Hargrave, I think, is the premier designer for this kind of play, at least in the two games 
in two of the three games of hers I've played, Wingspan and Mariposas, both have significant elements that are designed around this gentler cooperative play, even in, com in a competitive game. In Wingspan, you don't get to take other people's stuff, except for there are a couple cards in the European expansion that let you take other people's stuff, but then they get to take a thing from the bird feeder, so it's a, it's a pretty minor incursion on their collection. Um, in, uh, in Mariposas, you can always land on the same spot someone else landed. Um, you can get the same bonus they got. They get an extra bonus for getting there first, but there's nothing that prevents one person from doing something to s and someone else. That said, one of the complaints people level with both Wingspan and Mariposas is that they're very independent games, that you aren't really doing anything with the other players. You're playing by yourself, and then you compare your score to theirs. Uh, Wingspan has a little bit more interactivity with the uh, scavenger powers and stuff, but, but really, these are very separated games. You know, another, another example of a mechanism that I feel like allow, uh, encourages competition without feeling too, too aggressive is the military victories in Seven Wonders. In Seven Wonders, if you have more military points than your neighbors at the end of each era, you get some points. And you get more points than, uh, than they lose. And this is the part that makes it feel not so bad. If you just get zero military, your opponents can get, your opponent to one side of you gets nine points over the course of the game if you get zero military. Because they get one point in the first round, three points in the second round, five points in the third round for being ahead of you on military. And you get minus three points for each time you are down. So it's a big point swing, but it doesn't feel that bad because you aren't really losing very much. And generally, you're gaining more in taking those cards to do something else than you're losing those three points. Now, if you think of it as a 12-point swing with your neighbor, did you gain 12 points by not taking that military? A lot of it depends on how much military they took. If they took a lot of it, then you are probably really benefiting because they're spending a lot of energy building those military points. However, that's where the, the balance of actions becomes really interesting because if they took a little bit of military and you took none, then they get 12 points for like one, literally one card. If you take zero military in the first round, they take one card that has one or two of the little swords on it. Then they get those nine points and you lose three uh, without, doing, without you doing anything else. And they took one action to do that. So then you take one to counter that to make it zero and zero, but then, you know, then they have to take another and so on. It's an interesting arms race that doesn't feel too punishing. So I like the military battles in Core 7 Wonders. One of the things uh, about, you know I'm a big f fan of Mind Clash games and I think, I think Anachrony is amazing. One of the things I like a lot about Anachrony is that it doesn't feel as viciously tight as Tricarion. Tricarion has at its core a really vicious worker placement system where you want to be the first one to go to a location. You, almost, you always can go to a location. If you send a worker there, you'll be able to go there. But it's very limited. There's limited spots. There's enough spots for one, one worker per player to go to a place. So if you send two workers, you're blocking somebody out. But they've had a chance to go there if they're paying attention. The thing about, um, the thing about your carry on is that you reveal all your plans before anyone moves, and then you take turns moving your figures. So at the beginning of the round, when everyone reveals their cards, you have to look around and say how many action points did I need at this location? How likely are other people to go there first? And in the game we played last night, I had two or three different actions where I made a fundamental error in deciding what order I was going to go places. And really that, it, it cost me a lot. Well, that's, that could be the third subtitle for Dracarion. I made a fundamental error. But in Acrony, you reveal how many workers you're sending to the city, but you don't reveal where they're going. In fact, you don't have to decide where they're going until it's time to send them there. So the decision about what you're gonna do with your workers is tactical. It takes place round by round. And when I go to take one of the, say, the good worker recruitment spots and I, and I get my choice of the best worker, then you can choose, do you wanna go do a worker recruitment slot or do you wanna go, say, uh, do the build action and have your choice of which building you want to build? Or do you want to go get resources and get the only green uh, neutronium available this round or whatever? You know, there's a variety of different things that you can do each round. And of course, like all worker placement 
games, the longer you wait in the round, the more likely it is that you won't get the thing you want. But unlike Tricarion, where you have to decide where you're sending your workers before your turn, uh, in Anachrony, you get to pick round by round where you're going to send your workers. And the, the effect of that is really important. Uh, at the same time, um, you always have somewhere you can take them. In Tricarion, I often have had experiences where I just will have rounds where I don't get to take my worker anywhere. Uh, fortunately, you don't have to pay them then, which goes back to our conversation about workers. But Anachrony has another element as well to keep you from getting totally locked out of the thing you need, and that's the worker council spots. So in Akroni, the first time you go to a space, you get a bonus. The second, the second person to go to a space gets a lesser bonus. The third person, let's say in a four-player game, gets not much bonus at all. And then the space is locked. But sometimes the fourth person also wants to go there. You really need to use that. Well, there are these two spots on the board called the Worker Council, the World Council spots. And those are generic spots that you can use to take any of the actions on the board, as long as those actions are unavailable. So this gives everybody a little bit more chance to go and uh, take an action. If you time it right, you can also do it in a way that you pay a little bit of water, which is the currency of the game, and then you also get to take the first player marker. So that works out really nicely. So again, that is an element put into the game to make it just a little gentler, a little less, less likely to feel nasty. Oh, and I like that a lot. Hey listeners, future Brendan here. So this is uh, part one of the Pick Up and Deliver episode. I am going to reuse the introduction at the beginning of part two, and, uh, and then it will seem like two episodes, but I'm gonna add this, this note in so that it feels like one episode, or it feels more natural or something. Okay, back to the show. So thank you for joining me today. I hope that you enjoyed our stroll and chit chat about games. Pop over to Board Game Geek Guild 3269 and let me know what you think of this episode or this last two episodes. The more I think about it, the more likely it is I'm going to break this into two episodes. Uh, And uh, yeah, join me there. So thanks so much. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Brought to you by Rattlebox Games.